Hi, my name is Paul Marco, and I think the first thing I should explain as to why I got us all together and I set this whole thing up and I made this uh, little presentation. This year we've gotten involved in uh, child trafficking through Pizzagate, and we have been covering that on our channel for a long time. That was an area of interest of mine because I can't think of anything more horrible than being abducted and ritually sacrificed. And then, lately, we've been involved in uh, gang stalking. And we've interviewed a number of uh, targeted individuals, and the horror of that is beyond comprehension. I think it hit with ELF waves and microwaves that gradually eat away their body. So it's a very horrible thing. And oddly enough, I know, and probably you know too, that these are all perpetrated by the spy organizations. And the spy organizations we poured into the big triangle organizations. So I was interviewing a uh, targeted individual named Catherine Horton, Dr. Catherine Horton. And uh, she was working with organizations and she was talking about how organizations get corrupted. She called it deep capture. When they start working for the psychopaths, psychopaths working for psychopaths. And they're capable of doing things that are really, really horrible and evil when they get that way. Well, with my background, I know a lot about these organizations and different configurations of organizations. And I'll explain that in the presentation. I presented to her what I knew. And she says, well, I am. That's really insightful. And it's really motivational for TIs because TIs now have a glimmer of hope. So that's why I put together this presentation. And I tried to chalk as much information in here as possible. I have helpers who are right in here listening with me. And they'll be asking questions if I'm not clear because uh, that's what we're going to be doing. So. Uh, here we go. I'm going to start a little presentation. And the presentation is called Autonomous Humanity and the Demise of the Psychopath Magnets. Um, I have a PhD, and that's sometimes how you have to write and talk. So, so excuse, the, uh, excuse the formality of the, of the thing. Okay, here we go. I think it's, first of all, it's really important uh, that you understand the uniqueness of my background. I have a perspective that no one else has. <laughs> and uh, you might be shocked by it, you might be entertained by it, or you might learn from it, who knows. But the situation is, I had two degrees in education, and I liked being a school teacher. So I thought I'd get uh, credentials in public management so I could be an assistant principal. Well, that didn't work out. I had to go into the private sector to get employment. And uh, they saw I credentials in management and education, so they put me in the training department. Well, the training department quickly became the organizational development department. And I spent the rest of my life looking at organizations. And mostly they're the triangle, pyramid-shaped organizations. My, I'm an organizational psychologist. It's like that's what the brain is to me. So I study that, how it's moved, how you change the culture inside, how you pick people to go in, how you throw people out. These are all things that I focused on my whole life. Now, at some point in my career, I wanted to get a PhD in psychology, but I'm not interested in psychology. I'm interested in consciousness studies, because I think that the brain is a component of, the, of, the, of consciousness not the other way around. I don't think consciousness lives in the brain. I think the brain lives in consciousness. So I had to take the other track. So I got a PhD in consciousness studies and uh, did studies and, and even wrote a book called, the, uh, I co-authored with two other people. It's called the Post, um, Post Conventional Human. It's still available, it was published in 2011. And it talks about the studies that we've done with evolving consciousness. So, okay, here's a different lens for you. I've got credentials and said I've written books and I've done studies and consciousness studies. And I've lived inside of this big 
brain that I've been studying for 30 years. So you're going to get a different perspective. You're going to get a look at management, but you're going to look at it in terms of evolving consciousness. And uh, Catherine Horton and I think it's worthwhile information, and it might motivate somebody. And by motivate, I mean give them some hope. Give them some way to approach this big, bad, oppressing force that's on all of us. So, so, uh, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, something that's really foreign. People never even think about it. And the trouble about the problem with talking about this is, it's like teaching a fish to see water. It's so uh, so much in the, the ambient area you you don't see it. So you have to kind of reorganize yourself so you can see it. I'm going to talk. I'm talking about the organizational structure that we've lived with, and we might assume it's natural. We might assume it's so oh, and all ubiquitous that it's that it's everywhere, but it's not. I think it's very unnatural. And I'm talking about this structure right here. This is the big pyramid, and I'll call it a pyramid sometimes. I'll call it a triangle sometimes, and I. It's both. <clears throat> it, the pyramid, uh, obviously, is also the symbol of the entities that run this. This is a product of those entities. This is the structure. This is the matrix. This is how we've been entrapped. And we've been entrapped for probably about 9,000 years, since Babylon. This is the organizational structure of Baal. This is the slave system that humanity and consciousness, I'm a consciousness study guy, consciousness has been burdened with for the last 9,000 years. Now, personally, I think it was to train us, but that's my own opinion. So it's a 9,000 year old system. I've got some really cool slides here. It's an ancient slave system. This is how, this is how these entities, these elites, these I don't know what you call them, Freemasons, Jesuits, all the, the global, this is how they run. This is, this is their trick. And as we move in, into this further, you'll find that this is their only trick. And this is how they're going to do global governance. And it's not going to work. But we'll get into that as we go. Uh, the bottom supports the entire structure. In most organizations, if they're public organizations. These people right here support everything up. This is sort of like the coordination class, and from here up it's the parasite class. These people, their job is political. These people, their job is functional. So they, so the whole time humans are, are functioning in this, they're supporting everybody else. Everybody is on their shoulders. This is weighing down on human consciousness. I'm glad I have stuff on the slide. Guidance radiates from above, and this is real important. It starts back with the old uh, divine right of kings thing. You know, I get my information from God, and I'm the royal whatever, and I have these scribes, and then below them the armies, and it radiates from me. I tell them what to do. They don't tell me. That's a problem with consciousness. Because with consciousness, we get information from all different kind of ways. But in this structure, top down. And that's creating problems for it right now. Um, it used to be, in this organization, it was pretty strict. Um, that the buck stops here. So if an employee was guilty, the supervisor was guilty, the manager was, was guilty, and there was some accountability in that. But now that's kind of gone away. And th this is one of the things I see as a demise, the cracking away of this structure. You see this structure, <clears throat> the way it works. So I was talking about the buck stops here. <laughs> 
the, the way it works now, though, is we, since we have two tiers, it's obvious we have two, two legal tiers. The buck only goes up to the elites. So if you're a Clinton or you're, or you're uh, a George Soros, it doesn't matter what you do because there's no accountability down. It doesn't. So, so that's starting to break down. That's why I don't think they'll be able, be able to take this clunky old system into new world governance. They're going to have to come up with something much better than this. They like this, they like this structure for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one of them is that, you know, they can command the guy below them and, and no problem. Uh, I think another reason they like this is because this structure allows them to escape culpability. I think with this elite group, now I don't know how this whole thing works, but they seem to be obligated to, to tell us what they're going to do before they do it. Have you noticed that? They'll, 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 they'll give it in a cartoon or some, you know, and theory has it that the reason that they want to give you this information is so later, if there's a reckoning, they can say, we told them they were going to do it. And to them, saying nothing is tacit compliance. So we're agreeing to a lot of the things that we're doing. We're being vaccinated all over the country, I know in the United States, and uh, people aren't objecting. There's plenty of information out there about vaccines and the dangers of vaccines, and the, but we're not objecting, so we're tacitly complying. So I think that's what the psychopaths, elites, think that's going to happen. This structure also gives them uh, an escape from culpability because uh, you could say, how many people is, have Barack Obama killed, and you could say easily, oh, he killed millions of people, he bombs, he drones. Well, I don't think the elites see it that way. I think the elites see uh, Barack Obama maybe giving the orders or signing something. The people that are culpable are the people that are shooting them. I think that's, that's what they're going to say. So I think they love the system, not because I think this is their only trick, but also because this helps them Escape culpability. Uh, if that makes sense. Okay. Problems with it, it's a big, slow moving structure. And that's the coolest part about it. Because it's so big and, and slow moving, all the other more autonomous structures that I'm going to tell you about in a little bit are so much faster, so much easier, so much more um, productive than this big, clunky. It's built for stability and power. It transfers power up to, up, up to up a few people. It's a secretive organization. This is uh, one of the things that's a hallmark of this pyramid. It's secretive. This guy knows more than this guy, knows more than these guys, and the slaves know nothing. The less they know, the better. And that's, now we're in the, uh, in the age of the uh, dominance of the spy organizations, the CIA and the Mossad, they run everything. It's even more, the secrecy is even more important. It's an amazing system. Because you don't want them to know what you're doing. You can even compartmental them out so they don't know what this guy's doing, they don't know what this guy's doing. It's real secretive. I saw this level eliminate 90 of these people one morning. They had no idea what was going on. Boss comes in and says, Look at that. You know, you get the personnel guy there too. And, you know, we're going to lay these people off. They're going, and these people went home at lunch. I don't have a job anymore. So it's got to be secretive because you want to be able to you know, screw people without them kicking back at you. Now, here's something that uh, Catherine Horton and I talked about a lot. She's, she's really into uh, psychopaths capturing organizations. I think that these pyramids are psychopath magnets. I think we have a big problem with real powerful psychopaths in Western culture. And the reason we do is because we care and feed, for, feed them so well. We have plenty of these psychopath magnets. Uh, Normal people generally don't want to aspire to be a CEO or the president of, uh, of a 
large country, most people are pretty content to live a peaceful life without a psychopath. A psychopath is attracted to power. They're crazy for it. They're crazed with it. They've got to have it, and they'll do anything because they're a psychopath. They have no remorse. They're, a psychopath is kind of missing a piece of their personality. Um, they're born without empathy. If a psychopath, let's say you're born a psychopath and you have a little brother, the little brother gets a puppy, he loves that puppy, you don't understand it, but he seems attracted to this puppy, and the puppy dies, your brother falls apart. You can't understand this at all, because you have no empathy, you have no sympathy for people. So you end up observing your brother very carefully so that you can imitate his behaviors. And most psychopaths can do emotions better than we can because they study them. They know how they look. I mean, if you look at any psychopath, they have a norm, kind of a normal range of emotion unless they're caught off guard. I mean, if you take, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, any of these psychopaths, they have a normal range of emotion, but when they get in a funny situation, like, uh, Hillary did in the uh, one where uh, we came, we saw, we killed him, and then she laughed. Very inappropriate there. She slipped out of her copy. She, 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 she lost it. These are psychopath magnets. I don't care if it's corporate, if it's publicly traded, it's got to be a psychopath magnet. Uh, even private corporations, depending on how they're paid, certainly every government is a psychopath magnet. You're going to find them at the top. You know psychopaths are CEOs and presidents and stuff. You know, you think of psychopath being Jeffrey Dahmer, a whole other type of psychopath. Psychopath that's much, much more dangerous. It's the ones that are on top of these organizations. So, if you want to have an organization like this, when it gets to See, these, power, these people give their power to these people, these people give their power to these people. So when you get to this, you've got some power, man. You're looking, if you're a psychopath, you're there. Um, and if there isn't a psychopath in charge, the next psychopath come along will take his place. So they're psychopath magnets in themselves. So even deep capture of an organization, they're all deep capture. Oh, here's, here's a kicker. Watch this. If it's a public traded corporation, now I don't know about England or Australia or all those other stock markets, but I know if it's a publicly traded corporation in America, they're mandated to do whatever's in the best financial interest of their stockholders. So to me, that mandates psychopathology. Because you've got, out here, you've got oil sitting in the middle of a uh, Schwar community, community of Indians. Schwars are in the way of you making money. If you do anything but get rid of the Schwars, you're not acting in the best interest of your stockholders. Take cancer. You have, a, you have chemotherapy. How much effort can the can the board of directors or the CEO take toward getting new cures of cancer unless those cures are more profitable than chemotherapy. So they, so that company has to work against curing cancer. So they're mandated to be psychopath. If you had a neighbor that thought like that, you'd want to move out of the neighborhood. They're psychopaths. So they, they're mandated psychopaths. All right, here's a piece. Oh, this is really interesting. When I was in organizations, it's a top-down organization. Things flow from the top. That's normal. That's natural. But now, the biggest product that's produced by any, any company, I would imagine, is information. It's incompatible with this because information flows down, don't you know? Now, you have information being created in here. It's really a mess for a while. But now, what they do is they create what they call project teams. The J 
generate information, but they have a like a wall around it to protect it from contaminating the up down uh, down flow of information. So they have a, what they call a project manager, and these people are God. I, I work with so many of them. They're they're amazing. Uh, they can they can do what you need to do with the top down, which is uh, kiss and scrape and whatever you do with the top down, and they can run uh, a team where everybody contributes and they're part of a player. They're they're in there with them. That's how you generate information. That's how consciousness gets the information and it comes out in a team. But it's incompatible with the top down structure. And you're going to find out later that's even more true with spy agencies. And now, you know, I, I'm not sure that these pyramids don't report to Scott, spy agencies, all of them. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Oh, also, they have this cool thing, compartmentalization, where this compartment doesn't know what that compartment is, doesn't know what that compartment is. So they don't know what they're doing. They can be doing something in the, that's how they can get really good people to do really bad things. Like you're a clothing manufacturer and you make clothes for the inmates at Abu Ghraib. You know, you're not torturing anybody. And you may not even know this is going to Abu Ghraib. But uh, you know, you're in this you're in this division. And the one I always think about we know that Dying Core uh, is has a division that does child trafficking. I would imagine that the division that makes uh, airplane instrumentation doesn't know much about the tra child trafficking thing. But uh, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, uh, you've got vice presidents, and they get together four or five vice presidents if they're all in one one thing and they'll talk or they'll meet with their boss. So you got the vice president of instrumentation, you got the vice president of, uh, of European operations, you got the vice president of, of, of human resources, and you've got the vice president of child trafficking. Okay. I went to child trafficking, I spent five years there, and then they moved me over to instrumentation. How does that work? I mean, it's, it's amazing. Doing child trafficking, I would imagine that would be what Catherine would call a deep capture because you have to be a psychopath to work for psychopaths in that movie. You know what I mean? So that's how they can do some, that's what, how good people can be made to do horrible things. This is, this is a remorseful organization. These people are not free. They're not free to do what they want. They're not free to think how they are. And just like in governments, if you don't play their game, they, they deliver violence. They'll debunk you, they'll fire you, they'll, they'll end your career. So, so they're as violent as governments. That's how they keep people into the, in the structure. Because believe me, as an expert in consciousness, in consciousness growth, it's not natural for, for us to be in this structure. This limits us. This is a remorseful structure. Because you're going to be ordered to do stuff that you don't like. You know, the woman that you hired last week, the clients don't like her. So you're going to need to get rid of her. So you're going to figure out a way to get rid of her without violating the personnel codes. Uh, you, uh, your division is in charge of vaccines. And uh, we want to make sure that you uh, produce the MMR vaccine and have this element of mercury in it. Thank you, Mark. Go ahead and you're in charge. So if you're not a psychopath, thinking, oh man, I gotta choke it back, I gotta forget about it. But that's how people start becoming parapsychopaths, because they can't live with themselves. That's why, you know, you know, in the US Army there's more suicides than people than killed in action. You know that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because they're remorseful. Human consciousness isn't fit for this. This is not our nature. Yeah. Uh, now what we're seeing is 
is organized crimes floating up through uh, corporations and, and this. We have entire spy agencies that are child trafficking. I mean, all these things that are done uh, by the agencies. I've got child trafficking. And when we were working with the Hampstead cover-up, uh, people did an open source investigation. And they were able to discover all the rat lines by uh, bringing, bringing children, babies, into the UK. We could, we could find that out. We know that's happening. Do the spy agencies know that's happening? Does the CIA, MI6, Mossad? You bet they do. If they're not doing it, they're not interfering with it. I know MI5, uh, didn't, they, didn't they run the, uh, the Elm Guest House where they used to entertain politicians? And it was one the, the guest house was was an orphanage, mm -hmm. and they entertained. I think it was run by an MI five guy. So they're involved in the child trafficking. We know that they import all drugs. We know that the CIA, you know, they make a big, they make a big lot of profit. We also know that they do human trafficking, and they do human, you know, human trafficking that's involved with uh, organs because that's a very lucrative business, and also the human slave trade. So we've got solid trafficking, we've got the human slave trade, we've got uh, drug importation, of course arms importation, fast and furious, that had to be orchestrated by the CIA, uh, in conjunction with probably several military intelligence organizations. So we know who's doing this, and they all report up through this big triangle structure right here and they're fostered by the, the train. That's the bad news. The good news is they have to put up with all the clunky bad stuff about the about the, the about this structure. For example, um, Angela Merkel puts people who are government informists. They work kind of work for this organization. They report up through something. And they get a 10 per flat 10% tax rate if they're a spy. Or if they're uh, involved in, in Baldwin gang stalking, which is, it starts off by observing people and then ruining their friendships, taking away their livelihood. And then, and then they get so destitute that they're um, they're easy targets for electromagnetic weapons, which they wield also. Most of their targets are women, because they're a little less defensive. So anyway, so these Merkel spies are, are in the community. Okay, now if they work for the uh, if they work for the Triangle, they have to report to a supervisor. There has to be a supervisor who is coordinating their efforts, and. She or he has got to probably file reports to a manager who will look at it and coordinate it with the other people are. And then, after they do observe somebody, how many times do you have to observe it to get your 10%? And have they complied with that? I mean, they have to go all the way up to Merkel to get present. I mean, it's a mess. That's the, that's the good thing. Everything that works through this organization is a boon, is a boon dog. So you, you've got that. And the gang stalkers in the United States, if you're gang stalking somebody, what they get people out of jail to do this, by the way. They get felons out of jail. We'll, we'll get you out of jail if you gang stalk them for us. And what they do is they irritate people, they watch them, they tailgate them, they, uh, they just show up looking at them. Um, and um, so if you, if you see somebody and you call them in and, and you do something with them, you get $100. So you can imagine what a boondoggle that would be to try to track that. How many did you come, you know? It reminds me of this, did you all, did you all see the, the movie, uh, Mel Brooks movie, History of the World Part One? It's one of the funniest movies and done by a, a complete genius as far as I'm concerned. And he's, he's, he plays a stand-up comedian in old classic Rome. And he's unable to get work, so he's standing in the line to collect his unemployment. And uh, he gets up to the woman who is B. Arthur, who is a hilarious B. 
female comedian. And uh, he, she said, well, what do you do? Well, he says, well, he says, I coalesce the vapor of human existence into a comprehensive thing. And she says, oh, yeah, well, you're a bullshit artist, right? <laughs> he said, well, yeah, I'm a bullshit artist. And she said, well, have you bullshitted this week? <laughs> have you tried to bullshit this week? <laughs> And every time I every time I think of this gang stalking thing, I, I could hear him going to a supervisor. Did you gang stalk this week? Did you try to gang stalk this week? You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. If it reports into this clunky thing, you got you got a boondoggle. So let me tell you what I found. Thirty years in these organizations, in these big clunky, moving them back and forth, understanding them trying to doctor them up sometimes. Uh, I didn't work, I worked with psychopaths, but not that many. I worked at the, I worked mostly at the level below the psychopaths, so I could see their horrible tracks, what can I say? Uh, but I found that when people are left on their own, with little or no organizational constraints, and I don't mean morality or ethics, um, just people being people, they'll outperform any traditional structure anytime. And I've done this over and over again with organizations. I've moved people out of the organization, flat structure, no supervision, and they go crazy. Let me teach you a, let me teach you a trick. A lot of times I've had to go into organizations and uh, try to increase their efficiency, or try to increase the way they were working with people. What can we do to get this faster or better? And uh, I learned one trick early on. If they're, if they're working in shifts, you just go to that third shift and you work that third shift for three days or a whole week with them, learning everything they do, write down everything they do. And you can go back and your wisdom will astound everybody in the room. Because these people in the third shift, they don't, have, they don't have this organization. They don't have the triangle. They're by themselves. And they work it out. They get it done. They're not hampered by this or that. They can just lay their ears back and do the work. And I just write down what they do, take it to their boss, and all of a sudden I'm a hero. But it's without the overlay. People just rise to this amazing, um, enthusiastic, uh, self-actualizing, growing environment. It's amazing. Um, they'll, uh, to make this work right now, they have to have major objectives. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Can you explain, is the third shift this flat line that, that you would design yeah. on purpose? Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the third shift, <clears throat> there's nobody around. There's no okay. triangle over there. Okay. You can't call anybody, they'll be pissed off right. because you got them up in the middle of the night. So you have to make it happen. And you make it happen. So it's not, you know, it's not pure autonomous organization. Because mm -hmm. to me, a pure autonomous, orga autonomous organization has no leader. Um, but with that little bit of leadership, they probably had a supervisor there. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, still takes the weight of this this ominous structure off and, it, and it, it gives people a chance to actualize uh, they're responsible for themselves there's no remorse what they do they've initiated to do and uh, they've worked together it doesn't mean there's not rules it just means there's not rules which is which is the difference through the house. Okay, so why does it work? It's flat, no bosses, no authority, no censorship. Um, people now are starting to wake up to the fact that governments are inherently psychopath members. And that you don't need a government to do anything you've done. It's, it's kind of an Antarctic movement. And I talk more about that, but if you're interested in that, there's a lot of videos by Larkin Rose, Mark Passio, uh, I think even James Corbett have done those things. People are waking up to the fact 
it's a redundant structure. What I'd like to do is have you think about the triangle being a redundant structure. I should probably still have that on there. The triangle is not needed. Um, you can do anything with a flat structure, you can do with a triangle. Only you'll do it better, faster, and cheaper. It doesn't mean it can involve a hundred people because you could have several pods of these workers. I remember when I was a kid, and you probably remember, there was this really cool car called the Volvo. And uh, they still, I think Ford company, Ford Motor Company makes it now in England. I'm not sure exactly what happened to that company. But I want to call you back to the 50s and the 40s when Volvo, each car would be made by a team start with that car, they would, and it was like a handcrafted automobile. It was like driving a tank. If they wanted to, they could have made a car that would last forever. Of course, they don't want to because it's, it's anti-capitalist, but uh, these cars were, were, were priceless, I think, because they were handmade, and each team took pride in that, in that Volvo. I, I worked with teams that made jet engines in that same style. They come upon, they put together a jet engine. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't from scratch. It was an assembly type thing. And they would assemble this thing. It would take them maybe a week. And uh, they could turn it out because they were a team. Supervisor wasn't around. They were doing their stuff. They had measurable goals. And what we do is we take that afternoon when they were finished with it and we'd meet. And we do, hey, well, what did we do well in here? What did we screw up? How could we do it faster? And we could back. See, we had that extra time because we were going so fast. So that's that's how the structure works. And it could be a community. I'll show you one. I'll tell you one that's, that's popping up automatically. Uh, James Cormer uh, orchestrates this, this open source investigations. That's what Alan Abraham did. Everybody's looking, I think he's doing it with Pizzagate. Everybody's looking at this. Here's this component, here's that component. Is there a supervisor? No. They don't need a supervisor. They're going after the, the solution to that problem. <laughs> common Sorry. goal. Common goal. So it's very important to have measurable common goals. Because it pays into human nature right now. The way we're wired right now, and I, I think we're changing as we go into a more advanced stage of consciousness. Um, right now, we're, we love numbers and goals. I was working with a, a, a photo finishing company, and I was working at a plant. The plant manager had these little, uh, they were a little counter like people used to take into shopping centers, you know? Well, okay, that's 25 cents. It was just a counter. Every time you clicked it, it made the digit go up. And he went around and installed it in these little photo finishing machines. Now these people would come in, and they would sit down, and they would check the color of the slides as it would go through. It was a, it was a manual process. This is back in about 1984, 85, something like that. And they would check it. Well, they'd noticed the little counter. And they kept looking at the counter. Well, we had it on for about three days, and they doubled their productivity. They were competing. They were competing with one another. And if you measure something, it improves. That's one thing in business that some people don't know. If you measure something and you tell the people, it improves. Funny thing about that. It, it makes a consultant an, an instant hero sometimes. Because all you have to do is play into the natural thing. Also, you compete with yourself to make your own productivity better, just as a game to make it more interesting. Yeah, it's more interesting. Yeah. It's, it's like uh, uh, playing tennis and not keeping score. It's much more interesting if you're, you know, if there's something going on. It doesn't have to be competitive. Okay. You'll need measurable goals <coughs> up front. I think later you won't need it. See, we're changing. I want to tell you about evolving consciousness a minute. I'm going to take a little aside. This isn't in the presentation. Consciousness is a real thing. Um, we call it in the trade ego. 
ego development. It's a real thing. It's a real concept. It's a, uh, you can see it, it's been validated. It's a validated concept by thousands of studies by this time. And we have a reliable instrument that measures the level. So you have a valid concept, which I call consciousness, they call ego development. And you have a reliable instrument to measure it. So I can take someone and I can give them this instrument and I can see at what level of consciousness growth, growth they are. Let that sink in. People don't want to accept this fact. It works against the globalist game, uh, but it's a reality. It's not intelligence. Intelligence is a total different thing. Actually, measuring consciousness is a, has been validated a lot more than intelligence. So this is a more real thing. And it, and it grows from, I don't know how many people have read Piaget, but he studied children and how they change from one step to another. And then they have a big change when they go to school when they're about six or seven. And then they change. Well, that continues to happen throughout life. For most people, however, they, they're, they, are, they are arrested at the age of 7 or often at the age of 12 and they take that level of understanding of reality, of, of, of conceptualization of what they are, to their death. Other people constantly grow uh, and usually they go through dilemmas. Uh, divorce is a big growth enhancing thing because what happens is, you know, you've grown up, you see the girl, the boy, the family, the da 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 da, and all of a sudden there's a divorce. Your whole platform for understanding what's going on has been shaken. You might have lost a plank or two. So, you're, so your brain has a choice. It can either live with these new concepts and hold it in cognitive distance with how you, how you were before and you'll stay the same or you can think about it you can feel it you can ruminate on it and you can grow from it this will incorporate it and this will build you a platform that's a little higher in understanding how the world works and as you grow your concept of what you are grows from before you go to school, your concept is very small. You're just a little guy. and It's just you. Um, you've separated from your mother, but it's just you. And sometimes we find that they'll blame their actual body parts for things. Oh, my mouth always gets me in trouble. It's, it seems, it's identifying with the smallness of them. And as you get larger, as your consciousness expands, you identify with the group. You might identify with boys in the first grade and girls in the second grade. That's why this transsexual 72 different genders is so dangerous because at seven you begin to identify with that larger group and your consciousness expands. Well, it can expand through life until your consciousness is so large that it includes all of humanity. In fact, all of life. Now, with that perspective, you're an anti-psychopath. See, a psychopath watches out for their own individual little ego. I'm going to get that, and I'll have to kill you to do it, but I'm going to do it because I don't give a shit about you. That's a psychopath. This high-level consciousness, all they want to do is help humanity grow themselves so that they can even see bigger and bigger. They want to learn more and more. They want to learn the truth. They seem to be ravenous for that. And they want to help other people. And so it's like an anti-psychopath. It's like the opposite of a psychopath of these highly developed people. And with the, I think with the dilemmas we're being forced to endure now, it's driving people into these. Uh, wake up, wake up. And it's doing us some good, I think. Um, but I think we need to get out from under the triangle because we live a remorseful life. You're taking orders that you don't want to take. And there's always, always the threat of violence. Always. Um, in, 
this followership is more important than leadership. I could get into this. I don't want to spend too much time on this. But I did take teams out of their environment, and I rotated leadership. And I found after working with these groups, oh, from a whole bunch of different companies, Harley Davidson, Lucent, I mean, all these big guys, um, they found out that the followership is more important than the leadership. I found out that your commitment to the team and the measurable goals is the important thing. The leader can come in and out and you can change them. So in this structure, followership is what we need to do. And since we've been focused on leadership, it, it may, you know, every, makes everything go the other way. What, what the elites have taught us to do, reality is always the other way. That's an example. Uh, you'll need transition skills because we're conditioned not to be autonomous. We're conditioned to be a leader. We're conditioned to follow the leader. We're conditioned to be goody. We're conditioned to be obedience. This isn't about obedience. This is about functioning as growing consciousness. Uh, you need to learn to handle conflict, share responsibility, understand personality. But I think this is all part of capturing our natural consciousness expansion. Learning how to build common ground rather than find differences. I mean, all of you in this room right now, I don't agree with all of you on everything. But we have so much common ground, we can talk easily, we can function as a team, no problem. Because we focus on that, and if we have, you know, there are con, uh, there are ways to settle conflict, and you can you can learn these things as you get in. Uh, also, communicate, communicate, communicate. The most important thing in an environment, in a community, in a uh, uh, an open source investigation, any any configuration you're going to use outside of this, communicate everything all the time. Every, everybody needs to, it's exa exactly the opposite from the secret of organization. Communicate, communicate, communicate. And then the question may be, um, there are going to probably be, be people who can't function in this. If you're in a really um, stuck in a lower level um, uh, conscious awareness where you feel like uh, you need to blame or follow outside of yourself, you know, that's, that's, that's going to exist until we get more and more used to autonomous structures. And there will be opportunities for slavery as long as psychopaths exist. Now, let's go into kind of another, another phase here because uh, when I was talking to Catherine about this, um, one of the important things that I wanted to stress transition skills. We're, we're not, um, we're ready conscious-wise to move into this, but we've been trained by the pyramid to be in the pyramid. When you went to school, there was a principal, there was probably a vice principal, there were teachers, and then there were the kids. And we're trained to be obedient. Obedience is not what you want. You want independent action. You want Consciousness action. So, so I think there's a couple transition skills that we're going to need to focus on, and I just want to go over them quickly, so we can, uh, so we can move on to the end here. I think you have to unlearn obedience. Um, uh, doesn't mean that you don't have rules. It doesn't mean you don't have morality. It doesn't mean you don't have ethics. That's what the that's what the psychopaths don't have. They don't have ethics. They don't have that stuff. We have ethics. We have morality. We're moving in the same direction. Um, but you have to unlearn your obedience. You have to... I like the concept of natural law. I don't know whether you've ever heard of that. But there's man's law, which are all these laws on the books. And then there's natural law. Natural law affects everybody in the universe the same. Man's made law except Soros, Clinton, and so on. Uh, we all are obedience to natural law. I think this is uh, part of the escaping culpability that we talked about in the first half. You can't escape culpability for natural law. And how natural law goes is you're a sovereign, independent being. 
and you don't violate somebody else. Violence is not tolerated by natural law. Um, and if you are violated, you're very justified in using force, whatever that force is, to stop the violation. And that, it's as simple as that. And a law that demands that you become violated, like a tax law, or a law that demands that you violate someone else, is against natural law. And you should be able to disobey it, because what's going to count in the end is how aligned you are with natural law. So natural law should exist in the team. The team should never take violence. They should always do defensive force. It's, it's a clear, if you need more on that, you need to go to Mark Passio. He's done eight hour seminars on this, and you can know it very well through Mark. Uh, also, as we move into this area, um, there is right and wrong. It's, it's important that uh, this isn't about do what thou wilt. <laughs> do what thou wilt be the whole of the law. That's Al Alistair Crowley. This isn't about that. We're working within natural law and structure, and we're agreeing on how we're going to do this. We're agreeing on objectives, and we're moving forward. So you have to unlearn obedience. Communicate, communicate, communicate. I said that before. Everybody knows everything all the time. Uh, when I would do teams in an organization, they'd meet every day. They'd come in in the morning, 15 minutes early, they would have their meeting. It was all slicked up, and they all touched base. Of course, they didn't have any supervisors. So they all had to know what everybody was doing. Uh, also, I think it's a really good idea to learn each other. That's what I did a lot of when I was in organizations. Teach people about themselves. There's a whole bunch of instruments online. There's the Myers-Briggs, there's this, that. Find out about your other team members. Because what you're going to find out is you have a weakness, they have a strength. So you can play on that. Uh, he's a curmudgeon about these particular issues. We don't deal with them on that issues. We deal with on this issues. Build common ground. Eliminate psychopaths immediately. Anytime power starts coming into your community, Stop it. Get rid of it. Rotate it. Get it out of that person. This isn't about power. Conflicts are natural. Don't avoid them. Uh, work through them. Uh, what we would do is get a third party in conflicts when we work with a team. And if you're split on a decision and you're arguing, flip a coin. Because half of you see wisdom this way, half of you see that wisdom that way. Start it. Get your feet wet in it. And that's, these are just little tricks that I used to teach. Celebrate together often. Any little thing that your team accomplishes, do it. Uh, we live in South America, and they, they have fiestas every other weekend. And it's great, because everybody gets together, and we're part of the community, and we're doing stuff. Uh, in your teams, you're going to have stuff to celebrate. Don't shortcut it. Do it. Always do the right thing. Always. Always do the right thing. You're not, when you're, when you're in a team, you, what you're doing, getting out from under the pyramid, is you're getting out from under the obligation to do something that you might not think is right. When you start doing the right thing consistently, it becomes addictive. You'll get up and you won't, you won't even plan anymore because you'll, you'll want to allow um, whatever the good force is to drive you forward. So uh, always do the right thing. Uh, next one is problems and impediments. Hone your team. Remember I was talking to you about divorces creating uh, opportunities for you to change your platform? Same with your team conflicts. Uh, you'll get together. When you're a team after a while, it gets like uh, a jazz combo like uh, the Dave Brubeck three or any other really good jazz combo that's been together for three or four years. They play, and then they know the other guy's riff, and they'll have a little nod or a wink, and the other guy will come in and play. That's the way your team will get after a while. 
Uh, so if you just allow it to, if you allow your problems to defeat your team, it's not good. Get together, work through them, because it's a growth thing. You'll get better. If power arises, rotate it. Oh, and your, and your, and your, your, your strength is your quickness, ability to change, and your ability to learn. You can outperform the triangle in everything, even when somebody's loosely connected to the triangle, because you guys are out with the same objective. Okay, it's not going to work here. I'm going to call uh, a, a, my other coordinator. I'm going to tell, hey, look, we're not going to present here. We're going to present across the street because I see there's a problem with people out here in the street. So we're going to move right over. Just communicate it to everybody and you do it. Uh, it's, it's the strength of the team. Uh, and what I advise you to do is start immediately. Uh, now you know enough to get started. If you need more knowledge, go to pineconeutopia.wordpress.com, contact me at pineconeutopia at gmail.com, and I can give you some coaching through the beginning. But start it off. Start a team. Start thinking about it. Start a community. Start an open resource. Start doing something. Because I want to tell you a story. And this story involves more animals. I have a tiger slide, now I have a zebra slide. Here's what they've made us. They've made us zebras. And I think they're black and white, checkered floor, you know, the right and wrong, and driving us one to the other. It's really symbolized this. Because what zebras do is they watch the lion. They stay close to the lion, actually. They watch the lion. They want to know what's going on. Like us on the internet. Oh, they're putting FEMA camps in Florida? Oh my God, they've got uh, caskets in, in Atlanta. Oh my God, they're shutting down the... Oh my, we're watching the tiger. We're watching the lion all the time. And there might be some useful to it, especially for zebras. It's important. Zebras watch, and they watch out. And then when the lioness, they're always lionesses, begin to hunt, uh, they run. And invariably, the lioness will get the weakest one, the slowest one, the one that trips or whatever. And after they get one, we stop running. We turn and we rubberneck. Oh, man, I'm glad they killed that guy. Glad it wasn't me. I wasn't sticking my neck out. It's like we rubberneck when we go by a bad action on the highway. Everybody slows down and looks. Zebras do that. So that's how we are. We're, we're a, we've allowed ourselves to become a prey animal, just like this prey animal, because of the triangle and our oppression and being told what we're not. Here's another model that we need to aspire to. This guy. This guy's a baboon. He's not a prey animal, so to speak. I think everything in the jungle is a prey animal. He's not. But a baboon troop, they have a troop. And they, have a, they do have a high leader. When a baboon gets attacked, killed by a leopard, they don't let it go. Because they know the leopard's going to come back and get another one. So they go after the leopard. They hunt the leopard and they hunt it as a team. <clears throat> the most beautiful part is they move in, when they get the leopard cornered, they move in and they walk toward the leopard. They know the leopard's going to attack one of them. It doesn't matter. They're a team. And as they walk along, they put their arms out and they touch one another under the neck so that they know their brother's right there. They walk forward touching. That's communication in the team. You've got to have it. You've got to know your brother's there, your sister's there, and you're moving forward and they make short work of the, of the lion. Think of what we need to do in this turn of events, where we come to the awakening, where we're awakening, not only informationally, but our consciousness is rising. Now we need to regain our place in the pecking order. Uh, we're not zebras anymore. We need to get together 
you've got a little time, and that sounds great. But it's really what I'm, what I'm all about, is giving you the confidence and realizing that the way you're organized with natural consciousness, the way you relate together, uh, the way you can love one another, is so much more powerful than the slave unit that keeps pressing us that um, we're really quite, uh, we can make the war quite symmetrical and not asymmetrical. So that's all I have.